When you're analyzing data, it can often feel like you're investigating an unsolved mystery. You've got some problem or a data set and some hunches about what's going on. So you form some hypotheses and start to develop a narrative that allows you to tell a story and check out step by step whether or not there's evidence to support your hypotheses or refute them. Today, we're going to look at a popular tool, Jupyter Notebooks, used throughout industry and academia by data scientists to enable this sort of narrative-driven development, where we're going to do uh, write some prose that describes what type of investigation we're going to do, interleaved and followed by code that actually does the analysis and looks for evidence in the data, followed by more narrative that continues to build on that and more code and so on, such that we have what feels a lot like a scientific notebook where we're able to keep track of both the reasoning that we're going through while we're working through a problem, as well as the code which does the analysis. We're going to look specifically at how to use Jupyter Notebooks inside of VS Code, which has a brand new and awesome developer experience for working with this technology. So in order to use Jupyter Notebooks, and I should mention that the name Jupyter is spelled with a PY because it was initially made for working with Python style programs, but the Jupyter uh, universe actually has support for other programming languages. In this video, we're going to be looking at using Python in Jupyter Notebooks. To get it going in VS Code, you need to have the Python extension installed in VS Code, which will come bundled with Jupyter and some other extensions that make this all possible. Uh, if you've been working with Python, you probably already have those installed. So in the lessons directory, I'm going to set up a new Jupyter notebook. And I'll just name this notebook.ipynb. So notice right off the bat that ipynb is the extension we use for a Jupyter notebook. And uh, that contrasts with just the .py extension we would use for a traditional Python file. You'll also notice that this editor has many different things going on. We've got some buttons here at the top. We've got one text cell that looks a little bit different than we're used to being able to edit in uh, when we open a Python file. And up here on the right, you'll see that I have Python 397. Uh, you may see a button that says something about selecting a kernel or no kernel selected. If you click this, you'll get a list of the Python versions you have installed. And I would encourage you to select the most recent version. Maybe it's 3.9, maybe it's 3.10. You may be prompted by VS Code to install some extra uh, packages such as Jupyter and some others that are commonly used uh, in Python notebooks. I would accept all of those and that should get you going. Once we've selected a kernel, the buttons at the top might change such that you see this restart button. And we'll come back and talk about each of these buttons in due time. But let's go ahead and start thinking about this idea that we can do narrative or story driven development and have documentation leading the way and code interspersed with it. So I'm actually going to use, so over this cell, you'll notice there's this sort of pop up and I have the ability to click the delete cell button. So I'm gonna go ahead and delete one cell. The, the one that initially set up for us. And you'll notice that we have the option to choose from either adding a code cell or a markdown cell. Markdown is a, spe a special kind of um, formatting we can use to write text that will cause it to be formatted in a pretty nice, good looking way uh, once we, what we call render it or, or ha have the text be interpreted with formatting. But when we're editing, Markdown, we can do things like use the single hashtag to say this is a heading and say um, uh, demo Jupyter notebook. And on a couple of new lines, uh, I would encourage you to follow along and add some documentation that says uh, this notebook will exemplify some of the common use cases in Python Jupyter notebooks. Okay. You'll notice that to the side here, we have uh, this markdown is what it's telling us this type of cell is. So Jupyter notebooks are made up of individual cells that are ordered and uh, come one after the other. Uh, and if I click the check button here, you'll notice that it says we can stop editing the cell. And as soon as I do that, you'll see that we have this nicely formatted text. And I'm going to add, if you double click this cell, so I click the check and it will render it as formatted text. If you double click it, we can go back to editing it. So if you were to edit it with something like uh, two asterisks around the word sum, you'll notice that in the editor, we get slightly different formatting. This will bold that text. 
And if you go and render it by clicking that checkbox, you see that, oh yeah, there's uh, this has been bolded. So Markdown has some notations that we can use, such as this hashtag and such as these asterisks uh, that will allow us to format the text that we're writing in our programs in a common way. Markdown is a technology that's common in many different scenarios and environments around developer tools, as well as on the internet. And you'll find it in many different places around the web. It's a really nice way to work in plain text, but still get nicely formatted text outside of it. Okay, so we've seen a markdown cell and we can know how to render it. How do we add a code cell? Well, if you click the plus code button, if you hover over your cell towards the bottom of it, you'll notice that we get this pop up down here. That's one way of doing it. And we could delete this code cell if we wanted. You can also press the plus code button over here, and that will add a cell that allows you to type into it. Uh, and what we'll see is we can enter some code here. So let's say we declare a variable such as name, uh, which is type string, and say uh, the name is my name, right? And we can print the name, okay? So as we're editing this notebook, you'll notice that uh, we're able to enter some Python code into a code cell. We can again see over here on the right, this is telling us, hey, you're working in Python in the cell. And you'll notice this execute cell button that allows us to run the cell interactively. And so notice that Chris was printed out. Uh, and maybe we make this something a little bit more interesting, like an F string that says, you know, hello, followed by name, right? And I try running the cell again and we see, okay, yeah, we can run statements and, uh, and little snippets of code in these text cells, right? We can then go back to text and add some markdown. And let's add some notes about formatting markdown. So I'm gonna add a subheader here and say that we can do things like uh, you can have lists. You can have links. And so if I were to make an example of a link, that's something, a word that's surrounded in uh, two square brackets. And then um, maybe, why don't we uh, go and find a good reference for Markdown syntax? So there's nothing too special about Markdown. Uh, again, it's a very common formatting uh, language. So if I were to search here for um, Markdown cheat sheet, uh, what we would see is, you know, you can pick any link and I'll choose the first result. Uh, and you'll notice that here we've got some syntax telling us how to find headings. We can see the bolded text. Uh, some of these ordered and unordered lists. Uh, and then there's some fancier things that you can do in extended Markdown. So I might just copy this URL, markdownguide.org slash cheat sheet. And in these parentheses following, oops, uh, the, the link, you can have links uh, such as to a Markdown cheat sheet. And when I render this, so when I click this checkbox, notice that that's become a link that's clickable and it brings us back to where we were, all right? So in this video, learning a little bit more about um, the actual syntax of Markdown uh, is beyond our scope. We're not really worried about that. The point is, as you're developing and you're doing some data analysis, as you're developing your notebook, it's really nice to be able to mix in prose that's formatted in ways that are nicer and easier to read than you have in like traditional code comments, uh, interspersed with the code that's doing the analysis, all right? So let's actually talk a little bit more about what's going on uh, in, in this example. And let's, let's maybe add one more code cell below this uh, formatted markdown. And in this code cell, um, let's say that maybe uh, we print one more message that is uh, another reference to name made in this cell, right? And I evaluate that cell and we see another reference to Chris is made in that cell. So notice we're able to reuse a variable that we had declared and set up and run in a previous cell later on. Now, the model for how Jupyter Notebooks works feels very straightforward when you're working with it in this way, but as you get into some other scenarios can be a little bit confusing. The good news is VS Code and Jupyter Notebooks have ways of helping you understand what's going on. Uh, and one of the most important ones that I like to show is this variables button here. So if you notice up in our top, there's this button variables. And if I click that, 
you'll notice that we see so far in this running Jupyter notebook, I have a variable named uh, name. It's a type string and its length is four, its value is Chris, right? If we were to go back to this cell and change this, so hello khaki, right? And I execute the cell, so I press that play button again. Notice that it says hello khaki. And this variable value has updated down here in our uh, listing of variables. But something that feels kind of curious is, okay, we just changed this name variable in this code cell, but notice that the output down here still says another reference to Chris is made in this cell. So it's not until we execute this cell that we get that to update to another reference to khaki is made here. So hopefully you're already starting to get a sense of something that's really important to understand with Jupyter Notebooks. You get to run the cells in any order you want. And when you run a cell, what you're doing is you're impacting this Jupyter variable state, which winds up just being a global state effectively. So let's think about what's going on there uh, a little bit more specifically and what happens when we restart a kernel. So you'll notice that uh, there's this fancy word kernel and that just means it's the running program that's sitting behind your Jupyter notebook such that whenever you run one of the and execute one of your code cells, it's executed in terms of that running kernel. So if we restart the kernel, so try clicking this restart button, you'll notice that there's no variables defined and that feels kind of confusing because one of the features of Jupyter Notebooks is it saves the last bit of output from uh, any code cell that you've written. So it kind of looks like this program is run. It kind of looks like there should be a variable named name established. But when you start up a kernel fresh, like we just did by restarting it, none of your code cells have evaluated yet. So I'm going to show you two ways of going about what to do when you open an, a Jupyter Notebook you were working on previously for the very first time, or you find yourself in a position where you need to restart a Jupyter Notebook, which can be common if for some reason you get into a weird place or you just want to test your notebook to make sure that it's still working in the way that you expect uh, if you were to start over from scratch. So if this cell hasn't run uh, and we've just restarted our kernel like I just did, there's no variables defined down here, Notice this really helpful button that says run all. So if I press this, it's gonna go from the top of my Jupyter Notebook all the way down to the bottom and rerun every cell along the way. Notice that that means that this variable name became established when this first code cell ran and we're in good shape, all right? If I restart my kernel again, I want to point out that you don't have to run these cells in the exact order, but you should be very careful with this because if I were to go try and run this cell, right? Notice that we get an error. Name has not yet been defined. That's because the cell where we defined name, it hasn't run yet. So our kernel in its global state, which we see everything defined in the kernel's global state in this Jupyter variables box, hasn't been evaluated yet. So if we were to rerun this cell first, and then go run the cell that came after it that made a reference to that variable, you can see that everything works and all is good. This is different than how you're used to working with stored programs in a Python file where you save your program and you run the entire thing through once. And it feels a little bit funky, right? Until you get used to this idea that, okay, when we start a kernel or we restart a kernel, we've effectively got blank slate. No code has been evaluated in the context of this running Jupyter, Jupyter and Python program yet. So once we execute a, a cell, those two lines of code will be interpreted and evaluated, and we can run these cells in any order you want. Typically, it's best practice to write your notebook such that you can run all of your cells in linear order and have everything work out just fine like we have here. So I can run them all, and we see that we've outputted everything as we would expect. One other thing you need to be careful of that's different from a stored program that feels actually a little bit more like when you're working in the terminal in a read, uh, evaluate, print loop is, or a REPL for short, is that notice that this circle is telling us that we haven't actually saved the work in this notebook. We're running these cells in this running Python program interactively, but our work hasn't been saved yet. And you have to be careful of this because if you wanna submit work or send a file to a colleague uh, that, from a notebook that you're working on, you might not have the changes that you think you have saved in your notebook 
actually there until you save your file explicitly. So in VS Code, you can go to File, Save, or just press Control S on Windows, Command S on Mac in order to save that file. So in VS Code, when we see that dot has gone away, that means that we have actually saved all our work. One other thing that can be a best practice to do uh, to be sure that your notebook is working is you can clear the outputs of all your code cells. So notice that now the outputs you know, below this, these print statements are no longer there. And then try running all again and being sure that you don't have any errors going through. All right. In terms of things to be careful of, there's one other very important error that is common when you're working with a Jupyter Notebook. Well, if you're working and you're not working your way top to bottom and you go up and you change something early in your program, like let's say we change this variable name to user and we change this to say, hello user, right? And let's say we change this string value uh, that we're going to assign to user to be say mark, right? So when I evaluate the cell, notice even though we had taken away the previous declaration and initialization of the variable uh, name, that doesn't matter because our kernel is still running and it, we had previously seen, executed a cell that had name declared in it and defined, but now we've added a variable user. And notice that the value for that user is mark while name is still khaki. So if we came down here and evaluated this, we see that there's this hint that, hey, that you may not have defined name, but that's actually VS Code trying to be helpful. We can still evaluate this and this will still work because uh, name is still a variable that is in our global space because we'd previously put it there that's assigned to khaki. So it looks like this is still okay, but it's not actually what we would expect. We kind of expected this to be mark, but we forgot to update this variable name later in our notebook. So how can you protect against that? Well, one of the best things you can do is after you've made some changes to earlier code in a notebook, try restarting your kernel. Notice once again, we've now got our variables cleared. We run this again and we see that uh, user is declared, but there's no name because we removed that declaration. And now we have an error in this cell because the name variable is no longer exists in this running kernel. Remember when you restart a kernel, it's saying like throw all of the variables that were previously set up globally away such that all you have left are uh, uh, th that you're working with a clean slate and still you until you start to evaluate more code cells. So another reference to user is made in this cell. We can update that variable there and we see that that's now working. If I were to now restart this kernel one more time and run all my cells from top to bottom, we see that, okay, we're in a good place. As you get comfortable working in these cells, uh, and working in this mode, you'll often find that it's kind of a pain to have to take your fingers off the keyboard, move your hand to a mouse or something and press this execute button. So there are a few shortcuts you should know of. And so let's go ahead and add a markdown uh, column here. Useful shortcuts, keyboard shortcuts, All right? So the first is uh, execute a cell. and leave the uh, uh, focus or cursor in that cell, right? And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna surround, uh, I'm actually, get, let's put the shortcut here at the very start of this and I'm gonna surround it in back ticks. So back ticks are a special markdown formatting uh, that will give us code or uh, it'll look like code once we render this, what we call a monospace font. Uh, and so control plus enter uh, or return on a Mac uh, is what will cause a cell to be evaluated. So if I were to, we were to press that now, control enter, notice that in a markdown uh, uh, cell that just causes it to be formatted as in pretty text, not using markdown. Again, we can double click to go back into editing it. Control plus enter will render it. Uh, if we're in a code cell, notice I can make some changes here and I can press control enter and that's what will cause that cell to reevaluate and execute the code that's contained in that cell in the context of the running kernel uh, behind the scenes. Great. Uh, so that's one of the most common shortcuts that you'll use. You can just edit your code, control, enter, boom. Uh, another one is shift plus enter. We'll execute a cell and move to the next cell. Uh, or create a new cell 
at the end, right? Uh, and so I'm going to press control enter. Actually, let's press shift enter here. Shift enter and boom, notice that uh, we've moved down to another cell. And because we were previously editing the very last cell in our notebook, this went ahead and created a new cell for us. It made it a markdown cell. So in VS Code, it's continuing on with whatever type of cell you were previously in. It's making another one of the same type. But we can actually convert back and forth uh, using these ellipses here. So if you'll notice these ellipses, uh, and we can uh, change cell to code or change cell to markdown, and that will allow us to toggle back and forth. So again, if I'm in a markdown code or if I'm in a, a Python cell and I say change cell to markdown, that will allow us to enter some text. If I'm in a markdown cell and I want to actually write code there, we can use the ellipses to change it back to markdown. And here we could do uh, add some more uh, code. So a common thing that we might do is some analysis where maybe we're doing some arithmetic and this will be a very simple trivial demonstration. I don't have a good example uh, right off the bat, but let's say total is say a float. That is the result of, you know, uh, maybe we had previously computed some sum to be 110 plus uh, 1000, right? One of the common things that you'll see in Jupyter Notebooks as you become more familiar with them and you see what other people do is you're going to want to initially, because you're used to needing to print your um, values in your program in order to see them as output, uh, you'll have this instinct to write print and then total. Uh, and then maybe, maybe we'll add one more print statement that says, you know, some important computation. Bleep, blop, bloop. And I use control enter to evaluate myself. Oops, I didn't mean to set up a new frame there. Okay, so control enter evaluates the cell. And notice that these two lines are printing out. Well, something that's very common in VS, uh, in, in Jupyter Notebooks is that if you just have an expression, any expression as the very last line of a cell, notice that I ran and evaluated the cell one more time and we still see that expression being printed out. So I could say total plus, you know, 200,000 to make it obvious that we were uh, still, that this is actually an expression. And notice that sure enough, we're still seeing that evaluation. So in some ways, this is like a REPL where you can enter an expression and you'll automatically have it printed out if it's the very last expression in your cell. This only applies to the last line of a cell. And if it's an expression, the Jupyter Notebook will try and render it as output for that cell when you evaluate it. And this is pretty common and handy, so you don't have to always print something. You can just end your cells with an expression. So maybe let's make a note of that back up in the useful keyboard shortcuts. We might also add, um, actually, let's add one more markdown cell uh, down below uh, the, the, the cell where we computed that uh, or made that simple little computation and add another note that is um, uh, expressions written as the last line of a cell are automatically output. This is very handy for not needing to call the print function at the end of every cell. So typically when you're doing some analysis, the result of some code block is going to be some value and you just use that value as the very last expression in that cell and you'll see its output when you evaluate that cell just beneath it all right so that's very common so we can again restart our kernel clear all the output and try running all and we see that okay everything is still in good shape and notice that you know when you clear output any cell that hasn't been evaluated you see no output below it and hopefully that's pretty straightforward so these are some of the most fundamental operations you have when working in a Jupyter Notebook and some of the handiest keyboard shortcuts that will save you a lot of time once you get into the, the habit of using them. There's one other thing I want to mention, which is how can we actually import functions that we write in other files, Python files, into our notebooks? In order to demonstrate this, I'm once again going to save and notice that we made a lot of changes and ran a lot of cells without needing to save our notebook. So always be in a habit of saving progress in your notebook regularly. Uh, and I'm going to, in the same directory or the same package as my notebook, uh, set up a file that is, say, notebook underscore helpers.py. 
okay? And let's just define a very silly function here, uh, example of helper functions for a notebook. There's nothing fancy or special about my choosing the name notebook underscore helpers. I just wanted to pick a module name uh, that, that, that was valid. And let's just define a very simple function such as um, add to ints, right? So very, very simple, silly function. X is an int, Y is an int, and we're gonna return an int and uh, add X to Y and return X plus Y, right? So the point of this function is not to actually implement something useful, um, but just to give us, uh, and actually let's use Python naming conventions here. So I should name this add underscore two underscore ints. Sorry, I should use snake casing there. Uh, and so we've got our function. Now the question is how do we import this function into our notebook so that we can develop some helper functions and we don't have to have all of our functions defined inside of our notebook. That will allow us to cleanly separate some of our algorithms from our analysis and uh, reuse these algorithms or the functions that we use in multiple different notebooks. Well, something that's kind of funny about the way notebooks are run is that they tend to be run, the kernel is evaluating inside of the same package as the module. So how you're used to importing, say one file into another, such that we would say, you know, from lessons import notebook helpers. Uh, here, we're gonna actually import this in a slightly different way. And let's go add an example of that. So I'm going to, at the very end of my notebook, add a code. Actually, let's add one more markdown cell with a subheading of uh, examples, of, example of importing a module, all right? So we can import the module directly. So I could import notebook helpers, right? And uh, notice that I had edited this as a code cell and I evaluated it with control enter and we don't get any output, right? Uh, but if we wanted to, we could do something like uh, notebook helpers dot add uh, and then what did we name this? Two ints. Uh, and then let's say one and two. And we expect three to be printed out. And sure enough, your mind is blown. We've, we're have we printing three out. Uh, we can convince ourselves this works. Change uh, one of our arguments here. Reevaluate the cell in 21. Right? So that's pretty exciting that we uh, are able to uh, import functions from other places and make use of the functions defined there. Similar to what we've seen before, you can also, uh, if we wanted to import just the add to ints uh, function directly, you could say from notebook helpers import add to ints, and we can call that function directly, add to ints and 10 and 20 to get 30, and boom, there you go. Some really handy features that are built into the VS Code Python or Jupyter Notebook experience are that we can toggle our subheadings. So notice we can kind of collapse uh, some of this analysis that we've done uh, such that we can just see the markdown uh, and you can do this all the way at the top level. Uh, and then when we have, you know, here's the formatting markdown notes. Uh, if there was code specifically related to doing the analysis of that section, you can hide it or unhide it using these, the chevron that turns to the left or faces downwards, All right? So this is a toggle that allows you to hide relative to the headings of, of your document. And we can also see if I were to, you know, view the outline of this, uh, notice that what we used as headings, demo Jupyter Notebook, formatting markdown notes, useful keyboard shortcuts, the headings of our document we can find in this outline uh, and we can click around to quickly jump through a notebook because as you're doing data analysis, uh, some of the your notebooks might become rather long if, you're, if you've got a, a, a significant narrative around the analysis you're doing uh, to tell the story of, of your data and, and do the investigation. Uh, and so it's really handy to be able to jump around and jump to specific points in your analysis and do that kind of documentation. Again, some of the key fundamental ideas that I wanna just press home one more time are that when you restart a kernel, you are effectively resetting up a blank slate and until you evaluate a code cell, no code has been, no code from your notebook has actually run in this. And that feels a little bit misleading when you see some output here. So one of the first things I would encourage you to, 
get in the habit of doing is after you restart a Jupyter notebook or when you open one up fresh for the first time. So maybe let's try that. So I'm going to close my notebook uh, and open it up for the first time. Oops, that was my helpers file. So I open this up for the first time. And if we go and look at my variables, you're going to notice that there's no variables defined because um, in, in, Python, in VS Code, when you close the tab that has a Jupyter Notebook running, it automatically tries to stop that kernel on your behalf. So when you open it back up, you've got a clean slate, no variables defined. And that's kind of confusing because it looks like there's output here. Remember, the notebook is saving the previous evaluation of a cell's output and giving it to you here. So when you open up a notebook for the first time, I would encourage you to clear the output of that notebook straight away as the first thing you do, and then go run all and be sure you're still in a good place. By using this run all button, you ensure that you don't accidentally try working on your program later where you left off without having reevaluated your cells because you can get into a bad way. And let me just demonstrate that. So if I don't save that, or if I close that and I open up uh, my notebook one more time, okay. Uh, and I scroll down and let's say this is where I'd left off. This is where I wanted to keep working and keep working on my program in my Jupyter Notebook here. When I run this cell, ah, interesting. VS Code actually did something very clever here and it went and uh, re-ran the cell above when we went back in for the first time. That's actually an awesome feature that I wasn't aware that they added to this version. I, I'm actually, I wanna convince myself that that actually did what I think it did. Okay, so notice there's, keep opening the helpers file. Notice there's no output. Okay, and I scroll down to this point and I press play and that's just to execute cell. And yeah, it actually did something super clever that's going to save you some uh, accidentally forgetting to rerun all your cells, although I still think that's good practice. And it went ahead and, and ran those cells on your behalf. Uh, my understanding and, and the last time I used the default Jupyter Notebooks, it didn't do that for you and you could run into certain errors. In any case, uh, I do think there's value in clearing all your output and going ahead and running all and just scrolling through and being sure your program doesn't have any errors in it and then continuing to work on your program. If you're ever confused at what is actually in memory in your kernel because you've changed variable names and things like that, using this variables tool will help you get a sense of what's actually in memory. So that's the introduction to using Jupyter Notebooks in VS Code. They're a very powerful tool for doing story-driven development where you start off with what is the analysis you're hoping to do, explain it in English, then load your data, then set up what kind of hypothesis are you testing, explain that in English with some nice formatting, and then write some code to go do that analysis, and so on. You'll find this is very handy when you're uh, analyzing data, when you're trying to search for uh, certain features in your data sets, and when you're trying to make decisions using data science tools and frameworks, uh, and you'll see it all over the place in the data science world. Good luck with your Jupyter Notebooks moving forward.